Welcome to Content Marketing Engineered, your source for building trust and generating demand with technical content. Here is your host, Wendy Covey. Hi, and welcome to Content Marketing Engineered. On each episode, I'll break down an industry trend, challenge, or best practice in reaching technical audiences. You'll meet colleagues, friends, and clients of mine who will stop by to share their stories. And I hope that you leave each episode feeling inspired and ready to take action. Before we jump in, I'd like to give a brief shout out to my agency, True Marketing. True is a full service agency located in beautiful Austin, Texas, serving highly technical companies. For more information, visit truemarketing.com. And now on with our podcast. Hey, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Content Marketing Engineered. I'm joined today by Mary Keough. She's a SaaS marketing leader and a recovering industrial marketer. Welcome to the show, Mary. Thank you so much for having me, Wendy. I've really been looking forward to this. Um, I love both SaaS and industrial marketing. So although I'm a recovering industrial marketer, it still holds a very special place in my heart. Oh, I knew it would, because once you've interacted and been in this ecosystem, it's it's hard to step all the way out. You know, it's it's a special place to be. So, yeah, totally cool. agree. Well, um, today we're going to be talking about the industrial buyer's journey. And gosh, I'm I'm so excited about this. I know you've studied it and you have some pretty strong opinions on how things have evolved and how marketers need to think of this journey a little differently today. And I'm super excited to get into that. Um, so let's start with um, an easy one. So think back to your industrial days, which weren't that long ago. Um, what are some unique characteristics of technical buyers specifically? Oh, yeah. So this is a really interesting one. Um, so I am in the SaaS world now. I sell a lot into like sales and marketing, which is very different than when I came from When I was on the industrial side, both in-house and agency, you're selling to engineers, directors of operations, like people who need numbers. Um, So I would say that's the most unique aspect of selling to technical buyers is they need data. Like they, it's like a non-negotiable. You can't show them a piece of equipment and not tell them like, what's its output? What kind of like electrical voltage does it need? What is like the hardcore data facts about this product? Because then they can't put it into their operations and decide whether or not this is a good product for them to buy. So I think that is by far the like thing that stands out the most is like data sheets. I think you put this in your engineering report. So like what engineers like to review before they make a purchasing decision. Data sheets was number one when I was in-house. It was number one at the agency. You proved it was number one, even just surveying a wide swath of engineers. So that big hardcore data, they need it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's a table stake. And you know what drives me crazy is when people try to put things like that behind a form. It's like, no, no, no. This is just the the base level information. Don't put your data sheets behind a form, right? <laughs> oh my gosh. The fight that I love the most. Um, I don't have to have it quite as much anymore because I think people are starting to understand that concept. And it's, um, well, if we gave it away without a gate, then our competitors would know. And I was like, yeah, I mean, they're going to find out anyways. Yes, <laughs> like, and yes. is this really like, you know, they would claim the proprietary information stance. And it's like, is it really though? Is it proprietary information? No, no. Anybody could break down a product and you're right. We need to be customer centric first. So, um, so speaking of, you know, what I think of when I think about that technical buyer's journey is it's often very long too, you know, 12 months, 18 months, 24 months. And that's a long time to stay in front of someone too. Do you see that as you look on the software side, do you see these long buyer's journeys as well? Yeah. And I think it's so cool that we're talking about this because it is long, quote unquote, long in SaaS, but I think it's long in every industry because we have kind of a distorted view on what the buyer's journey means. So because SaaS, just like industrial, is mainly sales led. So sales starts the conversations, they continue those conversations, they bring in key stakeholders, like sales really runs the buying process. And the interesting thing is that's exactly how we measure it. So we measure it from the moment of the first interaction with sales, right? All the way up until they either make or don't make a purchase. 
Um, but the buyer's quote unquote buyer's journey is actually much longer than that because as you've proved with your engineering report, and as I've seen personally, just from a qualitative perspective, engineers and technical buyers are doing research well ahead of your first touch with sales. And so when you're thinking about running campaigns or what it means to get in front of buyers, you need to get in front of them before they're even making a buying decision. You need to start talking to them about what problems your product solves, like how they can um, implement certain processes ahead of even putting your product in place. So there's just so much education you can do ahead of like when the buyer's journey starts, like as in when they start talking to sales to like make it both easier and faster. So the interesting thing we're seeing, I saw it at the agency, I'm seeing it in SaaS, is when you take that approach of the buyer's journey starts well ahead of an interaction with sales. So we're just going to educate the market regardless of whether or not we know who they are, what company they work for, what their job titles are. We have a well-defined ICP. We know who we want to reach. That's who we're just going to start talking to. And we're going to start talking to them in the places where they spend time. I don't need to know who they are. I don't need to know what company they work for. We're just going to start talking to them. And then what we found is when they make that first interaction with sales, so they come to your website, um, you you call them and they answer the phone and they're like, oh yeah, I've heard about you guys. So from that moment of um, first touch point, the sales cycle is incredibly short then because they've already done all of that research ahead of time. So that's, I think the most interesting thing about like how we're defining the buyer's journey today. Right. So it's this long sales cycle, but the measurable pieces are shorter is, is what I heard yes. just to repeat that. So, okay. So this is an interesting, challenging for marketers. She said, be where they are looking for information. And of course, that's a bit of a holy grail, right? Where are they? And we have more and more channels available to us with the proliferation of social. And now we have even large language models where people are using those as search engines. So what advice are you giving to marketers the, these days of how to find those ICPs where they are? Yeah. Um, I just want to make like a side note. We actually had our first form fill come in and they in like the, how did you hear about us? They said chat GBT and it was very wild for me. I was like, that is so weird. It, it is, it is. And and I will tell you what, Mary, just to sidebar on that real fast. We just released our European research report this week. Um, I don't know if you've seen it yet because it just came out. And for the first time we were able to ask AI questions because, you know, it's new and uh, I'll be darn uh, 68%, I think it's 60, 68, 65, something like that said that search was the way they used AI. So it was search over things like testing and debugging and content generation and all those other ways to use, you know, the chat GPT and, and other large language models. It was, it was search. Here, here we go, That's marketers. Yes. Yeah. Super interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So you highlight like a really great point. So not only do we have now this like insane amount of places where people can get information, um, they're not controllable as we've seen with chat GPT, right? It's like whatever's going to show up there is going to show up there. Um, the more interesting thing is we ju- we have the exact same amount of resources too. So as an industrial marketer, I remember you not only had to be in all of the places and as all of these places grow, so does that breadth of places you need to be. But my resources are exactly the same. It's still (laughs) just me. Um, It still might be just like my very small team. If we were, when I'm I'm in-house now, um, I'm a marketing team of one with a couple agency partners. It's like, that's, uh, my resources are the same, but you're asking me to do more. So what I have been advising marketers is to number one, educate your leadership team on that fact. Hey, I'm still just a person. <laughs> I have the same resources. So you can't ask me to be in a lot of places because I'm stretched you know, thin enough as it is in the places where we're already at. Um, and so then the advice I've been giving is you have to make big bets. So you just have to say, this is where we're going to place our focus for the next six to 12 months. So, you know, LinkedIn is obviously where I found you. It's where I found girl 76. It's where I'm present the most. So I'll use that as an example. Mm -hmm. Um, If you decide, Hey, LinkedIn is the place that we want to be. Then 
it really is kind of cool actually, because it can change the whole focus of how you build your strategy and then how you execute on that strategy. So if we want to say um, our hypothesis for our strategy is if we um, go all in on LinkedIn, if then, right, for a hypothesis, if we go on all in on LinkedIn, then we will get more business sourced through the, through the website. So that's our big hypothesis. That's our strategy. This makes it like, it's kind of beautiful actually, because you get to just focus on this one channel and now you are creating content for this one channel. You're distributing it on this one channel. All of your focus is here and it allows you to both test your hypothesis really quickly, but it also like shows your leadership team, you know, people who are doubting, you know, why we can't be in all of these places at once. Hey, look what happens when we focus our attention on a very specific area, a very specific place. Now, what would happen if we did that same focus? So we're still focusing on LinkedIn and now we move to YouTube or to trade shows or to conferences. Like what would happen if we put all of our energy and focus into one place? Good. So, so, um, assuming that, which of course, if you were in charge of it, it would go wonderfully on LinkedIn. So you've proven <laughs> that out, but then I could see this conversation of, but we don't want to abandon that progress. So uh, is, is then you're asking for extra resources in order to go equally deep on other channels, or do you see a situation where maybe you pull back, I don't know, 50% of that effort and have it be on an autopilot, so to speak. Yeah, I would um, probably advise the latter. So, mm -hmm. hey, I need resources. Let's say Google ads. Like when I was at the agency, Google ads is still a really fantastic place for industrial companies to spend some effort and some resources. So the great thing about PPC, Google ads, is it's very easy to outsource, especially if you're already doing it well. So, and it's also not super expensive um, to, to outsource to just a PPC agency or freelancer. So I would absolutely say if you have like one channel, SEO or Google is a really great example because industrial companies do spend a lot of time there. Hey, this is where we have already seen success. So let's give that the resources it deserves. And then with this big new program, this is where the majority of our focus is going to be. Um, we actually had, so I know LinkedIn is um, a difficult example for industrial companies. So um, we had Jake Hall on Industrial Marketing Live like a long, long time ago. And he was talking about how wonderful he's seen trade shows go for companies who only focus on trade shows. So the marketing team, that's their job is to just really quote unquote show up at the trade show. So they're doing all of the, the follow-up, they're tracking all of the results, they're making it fun, they're making it entertaining for people who are attending. So I think like, don't focus too much on the channel and maybe just say, where do we want to place our big bets? Where do we want to go all in for our marketing program? I like that. And I could see how you could overlay, okay, we have campaigns or themes that we need to focus on, whether that's a product launch or a certain vertical. And then you have that focus combined with this, let's pick a few channels and do this really well. And I could see some magic happening in that combo. Uh, yes. It, yeah, totally. So Mary, once upon a time, I was the trade show coordinator, actually my very first tech job. I was the trade show coordinator for national instruments. I plan 60 trade shows a year, six, zero. <laughs> so there's somebody that knows Holy all about trade shows. It's me over the years. And, um, you know, what drives me crazy is when people, uh, go to trade shows and they focus so much on the actual trade show itself. They forget about pre-marketing, post-marketing videos, demos, presentations, PR opportunities. Like there's this whole, you know, world surrounding it. And even what is that call to action afterwards? Is it a webinar? Is it a piece of content? So, um, yeah, I love trade shows, but do them right. You know, it's a big investment. No, exactly. And like, yeah. and if, you, imagine if your marketing team did get to do that, did get to do trade shows the right way. Like mm -hmm. how would that completely transform what you just said? Now all of their focus, they're not distracted with minor changes on the website, updating the brochure, sending yet another email campaign. I hear a lot of industrial markers, marketers who are distracted with even just internal comms. So like mm -hmm. just making sure folks know about 
you know, some healthcare benefits or they run the newsletter or they have to like let sales know that this brochure is updated. So what if none of that was on marketing anymore? Maybe it's on HR or some kind of like sales support admin. And now you get to do marketing the right way in the trade show. So you get to do all the pre-marketing, you get to do the current marketing, and then you get to do the post-marketing. It's just, I think it's mostly a business level problem. And so marketing isn't really seen as like a revenue driver. It's not seen as a results driver. It's seen as kind of a cost center or um, a sales support center. So it really does start with like a mindset mindset shift from the top, unfortunately, but I have seen it where it can be done from the bottom up. Yeah, absolutely. And and one of those first steps is really deciding how do you measure success with marketing, right? What are your goals? What can you measure? And I, I could see where internal comms, while important, if it doesn't roll up to one of the key functions and goals for marketing, then we have a disconnect here, right? And um, so we have to think about that and in that resource allocation pie and how that you know goes back to those goals. Uh yeah, hundred so, percent. Yeah, so I would love to talk about measurement a little bit because, wow, okay, GA four. What what do you what are you thinking about GA four right now? Have you played with it a lot? Are you finding okay. value? Hot t- <laughs> yeah, hot take. I don't yeah. ever look at Google Analytics at all. <laughs> like even even pre GA four, I probably like did it to like look at some landing pages and maybe. Um, if we were doing like a major website audit, I would see like, what are, you know, our top landing pages, our top yeah. visited pages, just to like, make sure we were prioritizing things the right way. But as far as like reports or making like big decisions off of it, as far as like campaigns we're going to run content, mm-hmm. we're going to promote probably like never look at it. <laughs> well, what do you look at then? Yeah. So I look at mostly in platform metrics in the places where we're spending time So SEO and PPC is not a huge focus for us right now. So that's probably a large reason why I'm not spending a lot of time in GA4. There it is. Um, So a lot of our focus is, yeah, is in paid social channels. So I spend a lot of time there. Honestly, I spend most of uh, most of my time in the CRM. So just seeing um, where folks are coming in, what are their conversion points inside the CRM? Um, what are they saying in form fields? So if you have free form, highly, highly recommend some kind of free text field with like a, how did you hear about us? Or how do you want to start this d- project discussion? So I've seen that on some really great engineering ones. Mm-hmm. Um, what are some pre-qualification questions we can answer ahead of a demo? Stuff like that. Yeah. So highly recommend using free text form fields. And then, so I spend most of my time in in the CRM. Okay. Uh, I, I love that yeah. because uh, within that environment, what one, easier to get to all the reports and two, all of that customer data is tied together, right? It's not this um, yes. separate thing over here that's not tied to those customer records. So, um, well, okay. Then speaking of your CRM, what, you know, where, what's your hot take, if you will, on uh, lead scoring and the whole idea of, okay, you know, pushing leads through the different MQL to SQL to opportunity. Um, what, what kind of model are you using these days? Yeah. So we use um, a really, really simplified model because I think most people who are doing some kind of MQL to SQL, to opportunity to sales pipeline stages have found like, it's not that effective. <laughs> so we only measure high intent leads so that's the only lead lead type we measure. If there's a lead stage um, below that, we just treat them as if they're just another person in that research phase. So in that phase where they're not ready to make a buying decision, so they're not worth our time yet. So we're giving them all the information they need. That's fantastic. Um, we so, do not. So sorry, pay just just so I have a clarification real fast. Yeah. So you treat them just yeah. like like a new contact or a touch point but not a high intent person. Okay. So it's still something you watch though, to just make sure your volume of people entering the pipeline is sufficient. Would, is that? Yeah. So we don't even, we don't even say that they're in the pipeline yet. So they, um, I'll give you, yeah, I'll give you a super specific example. We have some old gated content 
um, like some field sales benchmark reports and stuff like that, Mm -hmm. where people like have to put their email in to, to download that. Yeah. We do not pay any attention to them. We don't do anything with them. We're very happy that they're on our email subscription list, but they are not treated as if sales wants to talk to them. Thank goodness. So (laughs) yes, thank you. (laughs) Yeah. So we only measure people who have expressed an intent to buy. So we have two big um, forms on our website right now where someone can make that distinction. It's a call request form. So they're specifically requesting a phone call back or it's a book a demo form. So they actually want to like see the product and like sit down with a salesperson. So that is the only lead qualification stage that we have. And then from there, they're either qualified or unqualified. So, hey, um, I'll give you a super specific example. We do best in the B2B space and we get a lot of people who maybe sell like internet services and stuff door to door and they'll want to like test out our product. And we're like, look, totally understand. Love your business model. We just, it's not the best application for you. Here's a couple others that you should go check out. So um, qualified or unqualified from the lead stage. Then we go into opportunity. We have five opportunity stages, and then that moves into closed one or closed lost. So that is the only thing we measure are leads, opportunities, closed one or closed lost. Okay. And then within what you described, what is marketing's responsibility? I mean, um, so if that high intent number, is there a target for that? Is that marketing driven, sales driven? Yes. The high intent leads are marketing driven, especially inbound. So we ran an outbound motion before I came on. It wasn't super successful. We would get a lot of leads, a lot of like quote unquote pipeline, but that pipeline would never really move into the later stages of our, of our sales funnel. So, um, marketing is responsible for inbound leads and for pipeline, but pipeline is also a um, group metric. So sales and marketing together own that pipeline. Um, And then as far as revenue goes, like sales, of course, is responsible along with customer success for closing and retaining revenue. Marketing has a piece in the analysis of it. So let's say we have um, an inbound lead come in, they match our ICP, they're, they're filling out a form. Marketing is, yay, marketing's working. It's great. There's a high intent lead. It's moving through our sales funnel consistently. You know, all the right people are being brought in at specific stages. It moves to closed one. So although marketing doesn't get quote unquote credit for the closed one customer, um, they do get credit for all the stuff before. And then I, as the marketer, um, get to say, what was that buyer's journey like? Like, let's reverse engineer this yay, closed one deal yeah. and say that. So then the reverse engineer of that is at each stage of the sales pipeline, what um, buying process influencers were brought in. So did they have to bring in IT? Did they have to bring marketing in? Did they have to bring company leadership in? What stage were they brought in and what kind of questions did they ask? And then at the opportunity stage or the lead stage, we have like a really great sales team who always asks, how did you hear about us? Where are you interacting with us online? So we get a lot from from that. And then we can always see before they became a lead and filled out the form, what pages were they visiting on the website? You know, all that good stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So one, how cool that your sales team is on board. They understand the value of asking those questions. Um, How do you, when you reverse engineer this, is that interviewing sales after this sale? Yeah. Yeah. We interview sales. Um, I know this is a problem in industrial marketing, not so much in SaaS, but we have like recorded sales calls. So all Ah. the calls are recorded. So I get to watch the recordings, which is like super valuable. I know that's not always the case in um, industrial marketing though. Well, you know, as more sales calls move online and uh, are less in person, I mean, that's, that's here to stay, right? So many people still aren't in the office. And so when it's possible to record it, I mean, yeah. And then you can load that into your AI assistant. Like we were, we were talking about AI assistant yes. before we started recording and, and think about how quickly you can analyze that. So, um, how wonderful to be able to just automate that, save everybody time, but get these very valuable insights that you can then, I assume in part help inform your sales enablement content. 
to use it in that way. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I think that dovetails really nicely into like uh, the talk that I'm giving at the industrial marketing summit. Yay. Ooh, let's um, talk about on... that. <laughs> yeah. So like on marketing sales alignment, this is very interesting. I'm probably the worst person to talk about marketing and sales alignment, which maybe makes me the best person. <laughs> I have <laughs> never had an issue with marketing sales alignment. I've always been super aligned with my sales teams, but it's because I, number one, partner with the right salespeople. I came from, when I was in-house, huge sales organization. So um, probably like 80 to 90 reps, um, and then maybe a marketing team of five or six. Mm -hmm. um, so lots of, lots of salespeople, not a lot of marketers. But when you start interviewing salespeople or they're asking for collateral, so Hey, where's this brochure? Do you know where this data sheet is? Do you know, blah, blah, blah. You know, typical yeah. questions marketing gets asked at an industrial company. Um, you start to kind of find the salespeople who are asking for like the really quality stuff. And then what I would do um, is say, Hey, I can like edit this for you or help you with the slide deck. Um, in return, can I just like do this like debrief with you after the customer call or even better? Can mm. I sit in on it with you? And I think not enough marketers realize how much sales loves that. They're like, what? marketing wants to sit in on my call? Like they yeah. care. I'm like, yes, I really do want to, I want, I want to sit in on your customer call. Um, so that was like probably the best way I got marketing alignment in house was just finding the right salespeople, um, figuring out what they cared about and then partnering together on things that we could partner together on. Um, and then moving to the agency side, whenever there was marketing sales misalignment, we were really lucky in the agency to always have like some type of leader as our point of contact, or they were like, you know, obviously an agency is expensive. So they're responsible for part of that decision-making. And what we were able to talk about is if there was marketing sales misalignment, it's usually at like the company level. So the business level. So where is there a disconnect between marketing sales and why? And it's usually what you described that MQL, SQL to opportunity stage. So marketing is responsible for getting MQLs or leads like from wherever they might get them. And they're not responsible for anything after that, or they don't care what really happens right. after it gets right. handed off to sales. Yeah. So once you start bringing in marketing and sales together on that entire process, they just start aligning on like the right metrics. Yeah, that's great. Um, I'll also add, and, and you'll laugh at this, but so uh, my husband has spent most of his career in IT sales and some with startups some with really large brand companies like VMware and HP that you'd recognize um, compact once upon a time that might be before, oh, nice. before Mary, but uh, uh, yeah. anyway, <laughs> and he, we would have these funny discussions. He'd be like, oh my gosh, those marketing people. And he would huff and puff about marketing. And so much of it uh, revolved around slide decks and messaging and collateral and not having the right value proposition. And, um, and so anyway, it really struck me that we need to know how to engage. We need to know what our metrics are and have MQL to SQL and have all these conversion rates. And the operational side is important. But if we miss on that value prop, then we're, we're, we've lost all credibility because now, you know, Randy's over there making his own slide deck and going rogue and, and all the other sales guys are too. And so the idea of bringing those resources in, and I love what you said about let's sit in on the presentation of that. So one, making sure they're actually using it. And two, how did it go over? What would you adjust afterwards? So that, that closed loop feedback and actually being there, it sounds like a wonderful idea um, if you spare the time to do it, which I would argue is really important to do. <laughs> yeah. And I think that is such a great example that you brought up with your husband too. Cause like I saw it too, when I was like in house and agency side. And I think a lot of it is like, I feel kind of bad for marketers, but like they should also like admit when they don't know things. So I think a lot of it is like, Hey, marketing, go build me this slide deck. And what happens, like what I've seen happen is marketing is like, okay, sounds good. Um, let's pull from these templates. We'll put it together and here's your messaging rather than like 
oh my gosh, Randy, I cannot wait to make this slide deck for you. This is going to be super exciting. Can you tell me a little bit more about the company? Can you tell me a little bit more about like the problems they're experiencing? Can you tell me a little bit more about the solution you'll be pitching? So I think it's all about like empathy, communication, like seeing sales as your partner rather than like, like the person above you who's like forcing you to do all of these like menial yeah. tasks. Right. And you're in this admin you, sort of role, you know, glorified admin of making, you know, lunch and learn posters and stuff like that. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes, totally. <laughs> oh, I know. Uh, so many things for a marketer to focus on. When you think about, uh, let's, let's talk to those solo marketers that are listening in a in maybe an SMB industrial company, when you think about their time as like a pie, right? And they can allocate time to different functions. Um, how much time do you feel like they should spend on this sales enablement or sales and marketing alignment versus just straight up awareness and lead gen or, or, or maybe you look at their time allocation completely different. Um, what, what is, what is that pie yeah. like? Yeah. So I think the first thing that you have to have to have to do is um, do a backtrack. So do a backtrack qualitative and, and quantitative analysis. So this is what I recommend to like everybody who starts out. So even if you've been at the company for five days or for 10 years, it's like this will be valuable. So the first thing you have to do is analyze your historical data. So if you don't have a CRM, I was there, we had a hard-coded CRM that rarely got used, but you have a single source of truth somewhere. It might be your PNL. At our company, it was the ERP system. And that's true mm -hmm. for many manufacturing organizations. So I had access to the ERP system. So then it's who are our major customers? How much money are they spending year over year? What's their lifetime value? Like doing all those like calculations and it's going to take you a while. So like, don't think this is just like some fun thing that you're going to like plug into Excel. It's going to be hard and it's got going to kind of suck. If you need help with it, please DM me on LinkedIn because I love doing stuff like this. So you're going to see like, where are your major sources of revenue? And then you're going to reverse engineer that buyer's journey. So if you have, you know, I'll give you a super specific example. We had like a major bakery corporation who bought from us regularly when I was in-house and they had locations all over the United States, but only a few of them were consistently buying um, product from us. So reverse engineering that it was, they had really great longstanding relationships with a few sales reps in those locations, not surprising. So um, rather than saying, hey, Mary, can we do um, an email campaign to every person that works at this bakery? Or, hey, Mary, can we do a LinkedIn or Facebook campaign? You know, whatever they want to do. Yeah. You know, whatever idea it has, you have to reverse engineer and say something like what I did was say, can these sales reps instead just like, I'll write the email for them, but can they like do a warm intro? Like, hey, Jeff, we've had this relationship for 15 years. You keep buying from us. You love our product. Would you mind introducing me to the director of operations at these four locations? I would just love to build that same relationship with them. Um, so that's just like one example. I think like reverse engineering from a yeah. quantitative and a qualitative perspective is just so critical in not only getting marketing and sales alignment, but also getting marketing kind of leveled up as like an essential business function. Yeah. So I've heard you say this is, I feel like this is a common thread throughout this episode is starting with the data, being analytical, working backwards. And if you, you know, if you don't have the ideal platform, you know, make a business place to a case to move to it, because look at all the examples that you've given us today of just what you can do with that data and how it can impact that buyer's journey. So nice. Heck yeah. Nice full circle back, back to the beginning there. <laughs> Well, hey, Mary, <laughs> where can people connect with you and learn more about what you have going on? Yeah. So please, please connect with me on LinkedIn. I accept almost all of my connection requests unless you're pitching me <laughs> um, and you can DM me anytime. Yeah. No one likes a, no one likes a pitch connection. Um, I actually had somebody comment and call it a Trojan horse connection. So connecting somebody and then the Trojan horse is like a pitch. Right? <laughs> it's very funny. Yeah, yeah. 
terrible. I, yeah, I've seen another funny. meme where it showed like the shining, you know, and, and he's yeah. behind the shower curtain with the knife. <laughs> That's awesome. Just don't do it, folks. Just nice. don't do it. Um, Mary, how no. do you spell your last name? So people who, who can't find you can find you. <laughs> Yeah. So it's Keo, K-E-O-U-G-H. Awesome. Well, this was so much fun today. Thank you for being here. Yeah. Wendy, thanks for giving me a place to just like talk about marketing, which is, I love marketing so, so, so much. So if you want to nerd out with about marketing with me, I would love to do it. And don't forget to register for the Industrial Marketing Summit, which will be held January 31st through February 2nd, 2024 in my hometown, Austin, Texas. And you can see Mary and me in person. It's going to be a good time, Mary. Can't wait. Thanks for joining me today on Content Marketing Engineered. For show notes, including links to resources, visit truemarketing.com slash podcast. While there, you can subscribe to our blog and our newsletter and order a copy of my book, Content Marketing Engineer. Also, I would love your reviews on this podcast. So please, when you get a chance, subscribe and leave me your review on your favorite podcast subscription platform. Thanks and have a great day.